Good morning to you, church family. It's good to see you in the Lord's house today. Uh, my name is Charlton. If you're a guest with us, we just want to extend a special guest uh, welcome to you. If you are joining us online, well, uh, thanks for, uh, for being there as well. And thanks for those joining us in additional seating today. Um, I have about uh, four things to tell you really quick. Uh, one is, is if you're a, a guest today, would you fill out one of those green connect cards and turn that into the, uh, the welcome kiosk and they've got a special gift for you for being here. So the other things are to do with this week. You know that this is a significant week in uh, the church calendar. Uh, first of all, on Wednesday, we're going to be doing a remembrance service. So we're just focusing on the cross and what has been done for us there by Jesus. That starts at 6 o'clock. We will take communion together, sing together, and uh, hear, a, hear a message from God's Word that night. And then on Sunday, we're doing three services. 8, 9, 30, and 11, and kids' worship is going to be at the 9, 30, and 11 o'clock only. So we said last week that a lot of our guests are coming to the second service, so if it is possible for you as our members to come to either number one or number three, that would help open up some seats for our guests today. There is a, a welcome uh, invite card and a seat around you, so Make sure and take that and give that to a, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, or a complete stranger and invite them to uh, celebrate the resurrection with us next Sunday. Um, the gospel will be preached, so if you know someone that uh, you've been ministering to and, and pouring into for a while and, and, and they need to hear it um, from God's house, then the gospel will be preached next Sunday, as it is every Sunday. Here, So the Lord continues to work, and we are uh, specifically praying um, throughout this season that the Lord would, would extend saving grace to the people around us, and he continues to do that and change lives. And so this morning, I want to uh, turn it over to Mr. Ben in the baptistry area, and he's going to introduce us to someone who's just come to saving grace, Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's try to get good morning, everybody. Yeah, thank you. See, maybe it's just I'm in the baptistry. I couldn't hear you. I want to introduce y'all to Miss Izzy Pressure. She's in our Sunday school class, and uh, she came to me last week and wanted to talk about salvation and baptism. And uh, last week, she gave her life to the Lord in my office in there. So uh, uh, I just, I'm, I'm just tickled as could be to be the one who gets baptized, Miss Izzy. Um, so, Miss Izzy, I got a few questions for you. One, have you confessed that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Yes. Have you asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, I have. And are you going to serve him for the rest of your life? I sure will. Well, based on that confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of death and raised to walk. In the so glad for Izzy. We're going to sing a song that talks about four days. One, just the coming of Jesus, the birth. We've been walking through a series called The Cradle to the Cross. It talks about that day when he went to the cross for us, the empty tomb, and when he's coming back and receiving us again. If you would, if you're willing and able, would you stand up and, and sing this one for us? could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved. Since far away, rising he justified. One day. 
when he comes. Oh, let's keep singing about this, Lord. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all men. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. And all Church, you may have a seat if you like. In the city of Jerusalem, whispers of anticipation are heard everywhere. The streets are alive with the news of the imminent arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. 
Jesus sends two of his disciples to fetch a donkey and its colt. He rides into Jerusalem, fulfilling what was foretold by the prophet Zechariah. As Jesus enters the city, a large crowd gathers to greet him, spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road in a display of honor and reverence. The atmosphere is one of celebration. This is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the embodiment of hope and salvation for a weary world. The people cheer. They shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And whether they know it or not, as Jesus passes by them, they are witnessing the face of God in the humanity of this man on this borrowed donkey. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Good morning and welcome to Harvest Baptist Church. My name is Laramie LeCue. I'm the pastor here. And I'm blessed to get to serve in that capacity. If you're our guest today, we thank you for worshiping with us. As uh, Charlton said, if you've never filled out one of those uh, Connect cards, fill that out for us and take it to the welcome desk. We really want to connect with you. We don't want you to just be a face in the crowd, a number on a page. We'd really like to know your name and your story and how we can best help you. The reason being is that we believe everybody is in process. Um, all of us are a work in progress. We see people uh, in our communities, and Northeast Arkansas really functions like a community. It's true that when uh, the times get tough, the tough get going, and there's nobody that rallies to those who are grieving or hurting or in trouble like Northeast Arkansas folks. You know, there's a saying that says Arkansas is like one big small town. That's an oxymoron. I don't know how you can be a big small town, but we understand each other. That's where English transitions to Arkansan. It's like a it's like a sub-language, you know, we understand each other. But what we mean by that is that in a small town, people know one another. People do life with one another. In a small town, people know what you've been gone to do before you get home from doing it. People know who you've been hanging out with before you even get away from them. People know where you've been gone before you even get home from there. I've lived that life. I know what you're talking about. I've come home those nights when uh, mom already knew where I'd been and what I'd been doing and who I'd been with before I got home. And I'm wondering, who'd you talk to? And she says, moms just know these things. But if they function like communities, Northeast Arkansas especially, and as we see people in our communities, even though we are close to one another, we see people in our communities who are not close to the Lord. They're unreached, they're unconnected to Jesus, they're unconnected to the church. And one of our goals as a church is we want people who are in the community, who are unconnected to our church, to become a part of the crowd. And when we say the crowd, we're talking about all of the people who are gathered here, members and non-members who gather on Sunday morning for worship, who gather for Bible study, who come together for fellowship. And so we want to see people who are unconnected to Jesus, unconnected in the church, in our communities, be somewhat connected to our church by becoming a part of the crowd. And when people become a part of the crowd, we offer a class called First Steps. And First Steps is those who are a part of the crowd who are non-members who want to become a member. They want to connect in a deeper way. And so we have First Steps class, and in that class we teach them the password and the secret handshake and all that stuff for being part of Harvest Baptist Church. No, we really just uh, tell people about Jesus. We want people who don't have a relationship with Jesus to know how they can become a part of the family of God, that they can learn that Jesus is the door of salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if they've been trying to make it to heaven through religion, to understand that religion is not the way to heaven, that Jesus alone is the way. And so if people don't have a relationship with Jesus, we want them to connect with Jesus. If they have a relationship with Jesus but aren't connected to our church, we want them to follow Jesus in baptism or to join our church by statement or letter. But we want to see people who were unconnected members of the community who became a part of the crowd who decide, hey, I see what God is doing here. I believe God's calling me and my family here. And they transition from being a part of the crowd to them a part of the congregation. The congregation is the members of our church who 
get together every week and we worship together and we study the Bible together and we serve the Lord and one another together and we give to kingdom causes together and we share our faith together and we learn to study the Bible on our own and pray on our own and pray with others and, and we just take steps in our walk with the Lord. And so we go from being an unconnected person in the community to a somewhat connected part of the crowd to a connected part of the congregation. And then as a pastor, you have the joy to see this happening in the lives of some people. They're a part of the congregation. They're connected. They worship and they serve and they give. But you see it happen and the timing is different for every single person. Somewhere along the way, that person begins to lean in a little more. They go from being that person that as soon as you say the last amen, they're the first one out the door because they're trying to beat all the other people from all the other churches to the restaurant, to being that person who stays after class so they can ask a question. They go from that person who, is, who, who never has a question about the Bible because they have no contact with it during the week to that person who sends you an email during the week and says, hey, I've been reading in Leviticus in my Bible reading, and if you're hanging in in Leviticus, you're doing work, all right? But at some point, they become that person who they go from never signing up to serve to being one of the first names on the volunteer list. They go from being one of those people who has never had a daily Bible reading to someone who is participating in a daily Bible reading. They go from that person who wasn't in a connect group to now not only are they in a connect group, but they're, they're volunteering to teach when the teacher is gone and they're asking questions and really growing. And, and for those people who set themselves apart because of their walk with Christ... They become a part of the core, and the core is those people who are leading. They are leading groups and ministries. They are deacons. They are people who, who just help lead the ministries and the functions of our church. And so everybody is somewhere on that paradigm. Everybody is somewhere in that process. You are here this morning, so now you are at least a part of the crowd, the congregation, or the core. But our discipleship plan as a church is to see people in all of those categories take the next step in their faith journey. You say, how do we do that? Well, as a church, we know that our community of Northeast Arkansas is filled with people in smaller communities who are unconnected to the Lord, unconnected to the church. And so we do things like put an invite card in your seat. All of you, whenever you came in in your seat, there was probably an invite card. And the reason that we put that there is not because somebody from first service left it, but we put it there for you so that when you leave here today, you can take that with you. You know what next Sunday is? Next Sunday is the day. As a Christian person, if there is ever a day when we get to beat the drum and say we have not followed a dead man into a dead man's religion but serve a living Savior, it is next Sunday. It is this week. And there are people that you work with and live beside who they may never think about going to church with you, but this week they will. And that card that you can take, it's your opportunity to just take that. It's a little icebreaker. If you struggle with eye contact, you know, like so many do, you can use that card. Because then instead of looking at you, they can look at that card. You can even move it around so that they keep looking at that card, you know. You don't have to put up with but you say, hey, I want to invite you to come to church with me. Wednesday night, we're going to look at the cross and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Next Sunday, we're going to have three services where we can celebrate the risen Jesus because we want people who are unconnected to the Lord and unconnected to the church, who are out in our communities, we want them to at least come and be a part of the crowd because coming together for worship and Bible study gives them the opportunity to hear about Jesus, the one who has made our life different, the one who can make their life different so that hopefully at some point they go from being a part of the crowd to going all in with Jesus and becoming a part of the congregation and starting to take those steps in their faith. We do things like the following weekend. The eclipse is going to happen, and they tell us that for the first time in history that like a jillion people are going to come to Arkansas, like unprecedented. You know, they, I, I don't want to be skeptical. I don't know how many people are going to come, but they tell us, hey, there's going to be traffic problems. There's going to be you know, food shortages and all this kind of stuff. And so if you're a doomsday prepper, your day has come, okay? Like we have made it. This is your time. And, 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 but, but on that weekend, if there's going to be people in our community, we're going to have a block party here on our campus. We're going to open up our campus and let people bring their kids and play on bounce houses. And, and the Sunday night before the eclipse, we're going to show an outdoor 
more movie out here, weather permitting. And, and so I, I, I recommended E.T., I think we should watch something space-themed. They told me, preacher, we can't watch Coneheads. I said, well, what about E.T. then? So I think we're going to, weather permitting, we're going to have an outdoor movie that Sunday night. That Monday, we're going to make burgers and hot dogs on the grill. We're going to invite people on our campus to eat a free burger and watch the eclipse on our wide-open property. You say, why in the world will we do things like that? Because there's people in the community who are unconnected to Jesus, and we want to connect with them so that we can connect them with Jesus. That's why we do things like that. That's why we print those cards and put them in your seat because there's people that you can invite to church this week that I'll never have a conversation with, I'll never interact with. And so we do that because everybody's in process. And I don't want you to be impressed with us. I don't want you to look at that and say, boy, they sure are smart for figuring that out. We're not. Like this has been happening in groups of people as long as there have been people. The people out in the community who are really unconnected for some kind of cause come together as a crowd. And those people who come together in a crowd, there's some people that, that, that become set apart because what they came together to do, that really resonates with some people. And there's some people that come together and walk away. And there's some people that they come together and that changes them. And it changes the course and the trajectory of their life. And even in Matthew 21, where we read today, we see that happening. We see people from communities all over the world coming together in the city of Jerusalem for Passover week. And as they come together for Passover, they're coming together as one crowd from the communities to the crowd coming together for the reason of Passover and it says in Matthew 21, 1, when they approached Jerusalem. Who is they? Well, they is Jesus and his disciples and the crowd who are now traveling with him over the Mount of Olives from Bethany into the city of Jerusalem. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them, and a very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. And others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. You see, people from communities all over the world had come together in the city of Jerusalem. And when it says, when they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, we're talking about those who were in the congregation of people who were followers of Jesus. They followed him from Bethany in and around Jerusalem. And, and so then you have this this collision, if you will, of the people from all of these communities and the congregation of Jesus' people becoming one crowd together around him. And Jesus had sent two men from his core, said, go ahead and, and find a donkey and a colt there that's never been ridden and, and take them and bring them to me. And if somebody says, hey, what are you doing? Just tell them the Lord has need of it. You know, I've tried for a couple years now. I, 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 I don't always you know, get to be the idea that we use. Like, not all the ideas that we do come from me because I've suggested for a couple years now it would really be uh, a, a neat thing to see if Charlton would ride into the worship center on a donkey on Palm Sunday. I'm like, Charlton, it'll really be a hit. Everybody will just, I mean, we'll never forget it. And, and either Ian and Ben have yet to find a colt on which no one has ever ridden or Terry said, I'm not cleaning up after a donkey. We're not doing that. But I'm still holding out hope. One of these days on Palm Sunday, Charlton's going to come busting through the doors on a donkey. And it's going to be a remarkable occasion. 
But you know, on this occasion, here comes Jesus riding on a donkey, and he's, he's riding into the city of Jerusalem, over the Mount of Olives, and into the city of Jerusalem. And this day is a day of celebration for us. You know, like we celebrate Jesus coming to Jerusalem. And the reason we celebrate him coming to Jerusalem is because Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem deserving to sit on his throne. But rather than sit on his throne, he was willing to die on our cross. And as Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem, this, this commotion happens where the congregation and the core members of Jesus' Followers are colliding with all of these people from the communities who have gathered in Jerusalem and they become this crowd of people who then begin following Jesus and putting their coats in the road and waving palm branches and, and paving the street with palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why do we call it Palm Sunday? Well, John, the eyewitness, has the opportunity to give us an eyewitness uh, detail that it says in John chapter 12, verse 12, the next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, and they kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is riding into the city of Jerusalem. He's riding from Bethany and Beth Page over the Mount of Olives and into the city of Jerusalem, and this crowd begins to gather and wave palm branches. Why palm branches? Well, palm branches were a symbol of victory in those days. Like in our day and time, it doesn't seem significant because now we pay people like a billion dollars to play sports. But in their day and time, if you won at the Olympic Games, catch this you got a wreath made out of olive leaves. You got a ribbon to wear and a palm branch. And that's it. But the palm branch was a symbol of victory in their days. It was a symbol that you had run a race, that you had competed, that you were victorious. And when these people are taking palm branches out of all the branches that were available and paving the street with it, they are ascribing to Jesus as the victorious one, that Jesus has won, that Jesus will win, that in Jesus we can win. As John writes that they took these palm branches and went out to meet him. This day had, for several hundred years after this date, been a solemn assembly. That people didn't celebrate Palm Sunday. They saw it as the Sunday when the Holy Week started. That this was the Sunday before Jesus would die on a Friday. And so they saw it as a solemn assembly. Not a reason to celebrate. But Luke includes the detail in Luke 19. How Jesus came near the path down the Mount of Olives. And the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. If you were with us last week, you remember us talking about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and how in the 4th century, some Christians built a church in the Garden of Gethsemane. They built a church there in that place where Jesus had prayed. They built a church over what we call the Rock of Agony where Jesus had literally sweat drops of blood while he prayed. And, and that church there on the Mount of Olives is the first church that we have record of turning Palm Sunday into a celebration. That it had always been a solemn assembly, but at that church on the Mount of Olives, because of what the gospel writers said, that to reenact this day on Palm Sunday, somewhere in the 300s AD, that that church got together on this day, and the people, they put palm branches on the road, and the priest at that church rode a donkey over the Mount of Olives on that trail right past the church and into the city of Jerusalem, marking this as a day of celebration. And since that day, Christian people have celebrated Palm Sunday. How do we know that it was a Sunday? Well, we count days. We know that Jesus was raised on a Sunday. We know that Jesus was killed on a Friday, and knowing that Jesus was killed on a Friday, we take what some of the gospel writers say. And John said this in John 12, 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. And so six days before the Passover, Jesus was in Bethany. So knowing that six days before the Passover, if Jesus died on a Friday, that means Jesus and his disciples had enjoyed that Passover supper on Thursday. 
So this puts us at the Sabbath before. Jesus enjoys Sabbath supper at the home of Simon the leper. And he enjoys that Sabbath supper with his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And that is six days before the Passover. So on the Sabbath, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. And later in John chapter 12, it's down there in about verse 12. We had read that before. Is our computer froze? I think we're having trouble running through our verses. But later down in John 12, 12, we read that verse before where it said that the next day, so, so six days before the Sabbath, that'd be on the, six days before the Passover, that'd be on the Sabbath, that's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the next day, which would be on Sunday, is when the large crowd gathered and Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. So we know that this day happened on a Sunday. We know that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this day all those years ago. We know that people put palm branches in the road ascribing him as the victorious king of Israel. Why is that important? Well, it's important because as we gather here to celebrate today, it's important that we know why we do what we do. You ever heard the story about the young married lady who made ham by cutting the ends off of it? Her husband said, why in the world do you cut the ends off of it? That seems like a waste. She said, I know that you have to cook ham by cutting the ends off of it because my grandma never cooked ham without cutting the ends off of it. And so they tracked it down. They asked grandma, why is it important to cut the ends off the ham when you cook ham? And she said, well, my pan wasn't big enough for the whole ham, so I cut the ends off. (laughs) Sometimes we just do what we do because somebody showed us to do it that way and we don't really take the time to figure out why we do what we do. But is it right of us to gather on Palm Sunday in the name of Jesus and to celebrate what Jesus did? Is it right of us to to turn an occasion where Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem into an account of celebration? Yes. The gospel writer said the crowd that day, they were celebrating, they were shouting joyfully, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They were putting palm branches out. This was a day of celebration. The Sunday before Jesus died on Friday was a day of celebration because on that day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, deserving his throne, but willing to take our cross. See, on our calendar, it's Palm Sunday. On the Jewish calendar, it was a different day. If you connect dots in the Bible, and I love to connect dots, Matthew 21, you turn that 21 around, you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, the people of Israel are getting ready to leave Egypt. And the day before they are going to leave Egypt, God says, I'm giving you a command, a sacred assembly that you will keep throughout your generations. You are always to keep this. It's called the Passover. And what he tells them, he says, this month will be the first of months for you. It's the month Abib. And in the month Abib, the first month, he says, on the 10th day, you are to select for your family a lamb. You select it on the 10th day, and on the 14th day, you sacrifice it, you prepare it, you eat it. Why do you need to select it on the 10th day if you're not going to kill it and eat it until the 14th day? Because you need to observe it. You see, God said it's important that the lamb that you use for Passover must be without defect. It must be spotless. It must have no imperfections. And so you select it on day 10. You watch it on 11, 12, and 13. And after three days of observing it, testing it, watching it, looking it over, if you're able to conclude after three days that it is without blemish, then on day 14 at twilight, you sacrifice it, you prepare it, and eat it. Why is that important to Matthew 21? Well, the day on our calendar that is Palm Sunday, on their calendar, it was the 10th day of the month of Abib. That means that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. That on Lamb Selection Day, Jesus Christ, the one who is the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world, that when he rode into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day, it was God the Father declaring to the world, I have selected for myself a lamb to die for the sin of the world. Selected on day 10, tested, tried, observed in the temple and in the city, day 11, day 12, day 13, day 14, the Passover. Jesus, the Lamb of God, 
had ridden into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. The next day, Sunday, Palm Sunday to us, Lamb Selection Day to them, a beautiful collision where we celebrate Palm Sunday not just because Jesus rode a donkey into the city, where we celebrate not just because the other people around Jesus that day shouted psalms and put down palm branches. We celebrate this day because on Lamb Selection Day, Jesus as the Lamb of God rode into Jerusalem to take away the sin of the world. What can we learn from this text? I mean, we want to learn from Matthew 21, but not just learn to learn, we want to learn to live. We learn that Jesus is the Messiah unquestionably. And so before you go any further with this text, you have to get that right in your heart and mind that Jesus in his life and death and burial and resurrection and his birth, that he fulfilled every messianic prophecy, he fulfilled all of the law. And as Jesus rides into Jerusalem... As we learn to live this text, we can take a look at the crowd around Jerusalem. That the crowd around Jer Jerusalem, they were treating Jesus like a king on Sunday. That Jesus rode in on a Sunday, and on a Sunday they're, they're praising him with psalms. They're putting palm branches on the road. They're throwing their coats on the road. They're treating him like a king on Sunday. Mark and Luke's gospel even include that detail that they called him the king of Israel. Jesus had told two of his disciples, go and find a donkey with a colt that's never been ridden and bring it to me. And if anybody says something to you, tell them the Lord has need of it. And Mark and Luke include the details that people did ask, hey, what are you doing with that donkey? Luke says it was the owners who said, hey, where are you going with my donkey? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And as soon as they said the Lord has need of it, they let him have it. So you have people in a crowd who are singing psalms about Jesus. You have people in a crowd who are lining the road with their coats and palm branches, a sign of victory. You have people who are willing to do anything that Jesus asks. You have people who are willing to give anything that Jesus asks. They're treating Jesus like a king on Sunday. I read recently about the Battle of Jericho in a social media post. It said this about the Battle of Jericho. It said, when Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, it required more walking than shouting. A Sunday shout is great, but it is no replacement for a daily walk. Amen. There was a Sunday shout. They treated Jesus like a king on Sunday and and, and aren't we capable of doing the same thing? We sing praises to Jesus on Sunday. We worship Jesus. We read about Jesus on a Sunday. But do we settle for a Sunday shout rather than a weekly walk? Like we compartmentalize our lives as Americans so much, this will make sense to you. When I say church clothes... You know the kind of clothes I'm talking about. When I say church music, you know the kind of music I'm talking about. When I say church days, you know the days of the week I'm talking about. As Americans, we compartmentalize our calendar. We compartmentalize our life that there are certain clothes and songs that we use on certain days when we go to certain places, but those clothes and those songs are not for other days of the week. We treat faith like it's only for Sunday rather than like it's for every day. But boy, a lot can change between Sunday and Friday, right? Because the crowds around Jerusalem were shouting Hosanna on Sunday, but by Friday they were shouting a different word. Matthew says in Matthew 27, verse 20 and following, that the chief priest and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. And the governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what then should I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all answered, crucify him. And then he said, why? What has he done wrong? They kept shouting all the more, crucify him. A lot's changed from Sunday to Friday. What about us? If the story of our life was written down, would people conclude from reading it that our Friday 
walk matched our Sunday talk? They treated Jesus like a king on Sunday, but they treated Jesus like a criminal on Friday. The crowd around Jerusalem who was yelling crucify, later that same day Jesus hung on the cross and the two criminals who were crucified with him, it says in verse 38 of Matthew 27, one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Yelling insults and... Shouting crucify. Matthew doesn't tell us whether or not the crowds on Sunday who were shouting Hosanna were all of the same people as the crowds on Friday who were shouting crucify and yelling insults. But what we know from looking at the crowds in and around Jerusalem is that There's a lot that's changed from Sunday to Friday. On Sunday, these crowds were shouting Hosanna to the point that the whole city was shaken, agitated. It was overturned. An uproar, it says in verse 10. That word, it always makes me think of my grandma's house. If your grandma's house was like mine back in the days when houses were built on a crawl space, they had that old... Maytag washer in it, and when it would go into the spin cycle, the whole house would go. That's the best visual image I can give you of what Matthew says was going on in Jerusalem. The whole city was in an uproar. Who is this king of Israel? And by Friday, they're treating that same man like a criminal. But as these gospel writers, all four of them, talk about this day, this Palm Sunday, when Jesus, as the Lamb of God, rode into the city of Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. And and as he rides in on Lamb Selection Day, and they're hailing him as king, that by Friday they're treating him like a criminal. The people in that crowd, some of them were not willing to follow Jesus, to become a part of that congregation and the core followers of Jesus. Jesus divided Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Jesus divided Jerusalem that first pa- that Passion Week, that, that week of Passover. He divided Jerusalem. There were some who believed in him and had followed him, and there were some who refused him and wanted to crucify him. And depending on which congregation you were in, it was determined by how you saw Jesus. But John, a gospel writer who gave an eyewitness account of this, that that on Sunday people said, Jesus, you're the king of Israel, and on Friday they were yelling, crucify him. John saw the crowd on Palm Sunday putting palm branches down, singing victory for Jesus and victory in Jesus, and he saw the same city a few days later shout, crucify him. But John learned that week that because Jesus was willing to go to the cross and die as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, that Jesus died for every single person who was in Jerusalem that day, whether they believed in him or not. That Jesus died for every single person in this congregation today, whether you have believed in him or not. That Jesus died for every single person in those communities, in our communities So that because of his death and resurrection, we could one day be a part of a different congregation. You see, John talked about a congregation, a crowd that was in the city of Jerusalem and around the city that day. And they were lining the streets with palm branches. But a later time, John was also an eyewitness of a different congregation that he writes about in Revelation chapter 7. And that's the congregation around the throne. 
He had told us that the congregation around Jerusalem had put palm branches on the road and were waving palm branches as a sign of victory. But later, as an older man, John sees a vision of a multitude in heaven from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. That this congregation around the throne, their song is unified, it is constant, it is loud, it is long, and their song is this, our God saves, our God reigns, and our Savior lives. See, in Jerusalem, Jesus was the man who divided that city. Palm Sunday, the city was divided. The Passion Week city was divided. Not only did Jesus divide the city of Jerusalem, Jesus is the one who divides eternity. And those who come to Jesus and see in Jesus the Lamb of God who died for their sins to take away their sins, those who believe in Jesus and receive him as Savior and Lord from going from an unconnected part of a community somewhere to a connected person, someone connected to Jesus in a personal relationship with him, following him. Those people one day will be a part of this congregation around the throne who will sing forever, our God saves, our God reigns, and our God lives. So where our Bible meets our life, where Matthew 21 and Revelation 7 collides with my life, and I learn not just to learn, but learn to live, where my Bible meets my life, I would ask you, do you hail Jesus as king on Sunday only to deny him the rest of the week? Like some of you, you have that invite card in your seat, and, and whenever you saw that and I talked about it, you thought, mm, boy, I, I know who I should give this to, but mm, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I can. We come in this room and hail Jesus as king. We praise him as the Savior and Messiah, but then we go into the world and we don't speak for him. We don't live for him. Do you hail Jesus as king on Sunday only to deny him the rest of the week like the crowd around Jerusalem did? Do you sing in victory on Sunday only to live in defeat the rest of the week? There is victory in Jesus. There is victory only through Jesus. The things that you are living with, the things that you are living through, you are not able to overcome those things. You are not able to beat those things on your own. There is victory only in Jesus. We sang the song, Overcome, today. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Singing in victory on Sunday to live in victory the rest of the week. Not to sing in victory on Sunday, to live in defeat the rest of the week. And so as we learn from this crowd around Jerusalem, as we learn from this crowd around the throne, it causes us to do some soul searching. Am I settling for a Sunday shout rather than a weekly walk? Is what I do on Sunday match what I say on Friday is what I do on Friday match what I said on Sunday would you bow your head and close your eyes Lord Jesus we come to you and this was true the day you rode into Jerusalem and it's true today you are the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world And what was true of people in the first century, Jesus, is too often true of people in the 21st century that that what we do and say on Sunday doesn't always match what we do and say on Friday.
Jesus, for those of us who know you as Savior, I pray that every single day we would serve you as King. Jesus, if there's anybody here today who is a part of this crowd, they're gathered here for worship, but they've they've never put personal faith and trust in you, I pray they would hear the truth today that not only did you divide the people in the city of Jerusalem that week, but you are the one who divides eternity. And where we spend eternity is all dependent on whether or not we have believed in you and received you as Lord and Savior. I pray that somebody would step into that victory today and find victory in you, Jesus. I pray that those who are living with struggles to addictions to anxiety to depression to toxic relationships whatever it may be lord i pray that today they would find victory in you and not just sing victory today but follow you living in victory every single day jesus we ask that you'd set somebody free in this place today holy spirit move and work have the freedom in our hearts and minds to convict us of sin to challenge us where we are not doing the things you've called us to do and being the things you've called us to be. God, move in our midst. Let us see your glory in this place. With every head bowed and every eye closed, this is the invitation. It's not just a dismissal song. It's an opportunity, as we said, for you to take another step in your faith journey. Maybe you're unconnected to Jesus, and today you need to come and connect to Jesus in a personal relationship. Maybe you've never followed Jesus in baptism. Maybe today you want to come and follow him in baptism, as as Izzy did. Maybe you want to join our church. Maybe you need to surrender your life to ministry or missions. Maybe you just need to come spend some time in the altar, recommitting your life to Jesus and recommitting your walk to him so that you can live in victory this week. Whatever the Lord is leading you to do, this is the invitation for you to say yes and take the next step. Are you ready? Let's stand and let's sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven. And spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Such boundless grace, the God of ages, step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of Declared the grave 
has no claim on me. Oh, that's the good news. Sing it again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope thank you for your attention and your attendance today so grateful that you gathered with us for worship if there was a decision that you needed to make, wanted to make, I know sometimes walking an aisle in front of a large group can be intimidating. Well, you know that I'll be available, Jason's available, our counselors, Shannon and uh, Jesse are available today, and so we would love to meet with you. I want you to know that right now in these moments as we are in here, there are people in the offices behind you who are praying for you. They may not know your name, they may not know your need, but they are praying for you intentionally because they know that as we sit in this place, that there's spiritual warfare that goes on in hearts and minds. We know that eternity is at stake and souls hang in the balance and that's a big deal. And so if you have a spiritual need, you come and find us. We're gonna, we're gonna dismiss our service, but the invitation is still open for you to come and uh, let us know what Jesus is leading you to do, asking you to do. We'd love to help you take that step. I think what thing he's asking all of us to do is to take one of these cards today, and we know somebody this week that we can invite to come to our Easter services, whether that be Wednesday night when we take communion and talk about the cross or next Sunday. So we thank you for being willing to be a missionary, to reach out to the unconnected people in our community so that they can come and at least be a part of the crowd to hear about a risen Savior this week of Easter. Another thing that we're doing next week, it's a fifth Sunday. On fifth Sundays this year, we are taking up a special offering for our building debt. We are rapidly paying off our debt here thanks to your faithful generosity. This is not an offering that you are obligated to be a part of. It's a free will offering, but we are going to take it up as a special offering. We're going to do that on fifth Sundays this year. Easter just happens to be on a fifth Sunday. So we're going to do it in all three services next week. And, and God's probably not asking you to, uh, to give a donkey and, a, and her colt, but he may ask you to write a check or something and put that in the bucket and help uh, go toward our building debt. And so that offering that we'll take up in services, that's not a tithe. Uh, that's not an offering to Andy Armstrong. That's a specific offering to our building debt. So I'd ask that you pray about that this week and see if the Lord might use you, lay something on your heart as a way you can give to that debt. Okay? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for joining us for worship. Leave here a missionary today. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday.